Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Dobro jutro. Time has flown over the last few days, and we now have reached the closing session of the conference. I am joined today by the deputy head of the European Union delegation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mr. Kaldun Sino, and the tribunal's registrar, Mr. John Hawking, my other colleague, uh, prosecutor, uh, Serge Brammers had to leave early because uh, of his work uh, schedule. He sends his regards to everyone here today. We will first hear from uh, Mr. Sino, after which the registrar will present us with a set of conclusions and recommendations which have uh, been collected after each panel session and which reflect our rich discussions and exchanges over the past two and a half days. I will then provide some brief remarks and finally, we will hear from a very special guest today representing the United Nations. With us here to my left is Mr. Miguel de Serpa Suarez the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and United Nations Legal Council since 2013. He has extensive experience in legal and international affairs and has been crucially instrumental for the ICTY along with his excellent team of seasoned lawyers. I have had the pleasure to work closely with him during my presidency, which has coincided with the tribunal's final biennium. I take this opportunity to publicly thank the legal council for gracing us today with his presence. And I kindly ask him to uh, convey our utmost gratitude also to the United Nations. Thank you, thank you. I now give the floor to Mr. Kaldun Sino, Deputy Head of the European Union Delegation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be here today to address you at the concluding session of this uh, ICTY Legacy Conference. Now, over the past three days, you have discussed the legacy of the uh, ICTY in a strictly uh, a linguistic sense. Legacy is something that has to be handed down from the past, and it's very much that, as current events across the globe show us, sadly. Crimes committed in the context of national, but also international armed conflicts are not part of the past, but very much part of our reality on a daily basis. They continue to occur and they're very much present and they're victims that do suffer and that must not be forgotten. Now, your legacy, the ICTY's legacy in that context uh, must remind us therefore of three crucial aspects and imperatives. All of us, the international community, nation states, but also individual citizens, we all have a responsibility, must remain vigilant Wherever voices of hatred and incitement are about to drive societies, states, regions into repeated patterns of murder, persecution, extinctions, and other forms of the most severe crimes. All of us must preserve and develop the ICTY's legacy, be it in political circles, in universities, law schools, but also in communities and organizations. Thirdly, all of us the international community and nation states alike, international organizations, have a moral and legal duty to prevent, to protect, to protect and to punish recurring crimes and armed conflict. In this, conflict, uh, in this context, of course, the, um, the concept of early warning, where we work together very much with the uh, United Nations as well, is extremely important to alert us. Now, the European Council reaffirmed the EU's support to the process of transitional justice in unquestionable terms in November 2015, 
where we set the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with the society's attempts to come to terms with the legacy of large-scale large past abuses in order to ensure accountability, serve justice, and also achieve reconciliation. Now, when the ICTY closes at the end of 2017, after 24 years, it will have been a true pioneer, showing the world ways how to transform noble principles and solemn practices into reality. At the end, this is the expectation that we have from any future judicial endeavor in that respect. Now, with all difficulties and ups and downs the ICTY has faced over the years, this pioneering role as such is a truly great accomplishment. It will leave a strong imprint on the history of international criminal law and the way future conflicts will be investigated, tried, adjudicated, and we should add, as I said before, hopefully prevented. I think it's no understanding, in fact, I don't think, I know it is no understatement to say that the ICTY has contributed to establishing a new legal order in this world. Now, let me move from these general reflections to concrete items of this conference and let us together review later, we'll hear more details on the conclusion, the importance for the future of the Western Balkans in general, but also for Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular. Of the past days, panels of experts debated fundamental questions in the context of the tribunal's legacy, looking particularly at the impact of the ICTY jurisprudence on the office of the prosecutors, on national jurisdictions, the impact on gender injustice, the role of defense, and ICTY operational and historical impacts on the contribution to criminal justice, to peace and reconciliation in post-conflict societies. Especially with regard to the last point, to reconciliation in post-conflict societies, I would like to note that criminal, criminal justice does have its clear limits, and that peace and society uh, peace and reconciliation will finally depend on the readiness and willingness of a given society and its leaders to go the whole way. Concretely, it means to engage in continued dialogue, to reach out, but primarily to refrain from using language or take actions that incite hatred and nourish the wounds of the past rather than heal them. As flagged by many of the past months, including by Prosecutor Bramatz, who had to leave us, uh, repeatedly in his reports to the UN Security Council, politicians, officials from the region undermine trust in the judiciary, and uh, in, in the judicial accountability for war crimes, whilst at the same time glorification of war criminals continue, and there's generally a backsliding by current governments and officials to commit to transitional ju justice. From the new perspective, I must note that it is clear to everyone that rhetoric of the past, of hatred, is an obstacle to any future EU accession. We noted, as you know, we every year um, publish our political assessment uh, of the region, and in 2006 we noted in our communication on enlargement that more responsible political leadership and further efforts towards reconciliation are essential for promoting stability and the creation of an environment conducive to overcoming the legacy of the past. Dealing with the past in the regional context is embedded in our enlargement process for this region and it's a clear accession requirement. Without reconciliation, we will also harm the individual country's prospects for EU enlargement. There will be no European future for countries in the region, including Bosnia-Herzegovina, without undertaking serious and credible efforts in this respect. If we want to honor and further the legacy of the ICTY, we must build on its achievements and take its work beyond the limitations of criminal law. Now, we, the European Union, are fully determined to support this process, be it politically or financially. financially. Here in Bosnia-Herzegovina, we are directly helping the authorities uh, to process a backlog of war crimes cases, along with the amended national war crimes strategy and its adjusted time frame. However, the EU is fully committed to extend support around the greater lines of peace and reconciliation. Transitional justice is part of the broader framework of the EU commitments to peace, democracy, human rights and development. Now, the conclusions and recommendations of this 
conference constitute an important element or an important part of a puzzle that will hopefully lead to further steps in the direction of truth, reconciliation, peace, and stability. We call on the authorities in Bosnia-Herzegovina, indeed, not only in Bosnia-Herzegovina, but across the region, to support and launch a renewed effort to revisit the ghosts of the past so as to be able to look forward. And I think there's no better vehicle to looking forward, both for the administrations, the politicians, and all citizens than the European integration process. In the end, on behalf of the European Union, uh, I want to extend my wholehearted and our wholehearted thanks and appreciation to the organizers of this conference, to the many of you who helped, participated, and the audience for your active participation, and all of us who will carry the conclusions and recommendations forward in the days, in the months, but also years ahead of us. Now, the Roman Emperor, Emperor Augustus said about his uncle Caesar once that he, Caesar, quote, he could boast that he had inherited brick and left it marble. Now, we certainly are not yet quite in the marble stage of the process, but we certainly hope to continue that process on build on the foundations that you, the ICTY, has laid and help us in the work ahead. Thank you very much. I thank Ambassador Sino for his kind words and support on behalf of the European Union. Indeed, the European Union and its member states has played a key role during the tribunal's functioning and has stood by our side over the past 24 years. It has also been pivotal in allowing this conference to take place by way of a very generous funding. We are extremely appreciative, Ambassador. I now give the floor to John Hawking, the Tribunal's Registrar, who will present the conference's uh, conclusions and recommendations. John. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning again, uh, Excellencies, Mr. Legal Counsel, Distinguished guests, colleagues, friends, we're very glad that um, it's very good to see you all again after an extraordinary two and a half days. Over 200 participants coming from Texas to Tusla, eight panels, 34 speakers, 10 side events, a reception at the beautiful Sarajevo City Hall. Um, how do I summarize all of that? First, I'll um, play a, a short video. If every picture's worth a thousand words, I've just saved us about 40,000. 
Much has been spoken because there's so much to say, and we've heard from judges, the OTP, the defence, the registry, from practitioners as well as academics. And perhaps most importantly, we heard from the victims. We heard international approaches and national perspectives. We asked the difficult questions, we reflected on lessons learned, and we shared best practices. Thank you to all of you for making this historic conference unforgettable. The conclusions and recommendations that emerged from this historic conference, the last that sees the ICTY here as an institution in Sarajevo, have been captured in a draft document put together by the moderators of each of the panels. Um, and I want to thank the team because I know that they were there. I don't think they got any sleep or very little sleep last night. So thank you very much for, for all your hard work in putting that together. We'll, um, we'll hand that out at the end of this session. If I were to go through all of those conclusions and those recommendations, those 40,000 words would come back very, very quickly. So what I will do is just highlight um, a few key messages that um, have stood out for me personally. But what we plan to do with this document is to finalize it, and then we hope that it will actually assist international and domestic courts and tribunals in their pursuit of justice. So I just highlight a few points that have stood out for me. First, when the ICTY closes, our jurisprudence will live on. Our rulings will continue to inform the work of national, regional, and international courts well beyond the closure of the ICTY at the end of this year. And within our jurisprudence, a predominant feature has been our work on sexual violence in conflict. And it's estimated that there were up to 70,000 victims of sexual crimes during the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. The ICTY took groundbreaking steps in prosecuting these crimes, and it's been a catalyst for a bold and irreversible change. However, of course, there's much that still remains to be done, and we heard from Prosecutor Bramitz when he related the story of a woman here in Bosnia who was raped in 1995, but she only came forward to report the rape in 2017, this year. And when she was asked why she waited so long, she said she waited because she wanted to wait until her husband had died before she reported the rape. We also discussed in different contexts how the ICTY was not established to abolish or replace national ju justice bodies, despite its primary but temporary jurisdic jurisdiction, but rather should strengthen and complement them. And with the completion strategy of the ICTY, the cases were brought back to where they belonged. And along with the cases, the ICTY transferred ideas, models, and practical tools to support domestic war crimes proceedings. One area where we've been able to transfer knowledge is in victim and witness support. And support is a commitment that can be a lifelong one. The ICTY, we heard, developed a pioneering witness-centered approach in which logistics, support, and protection services are all integrated. And this witness-centered approach has also been taken as a model by the witness services established in the region. And it's extended even to witnesses outside of domestic war crimes trials. As Alma Tasso Delkovic, the head of the witness support office of the Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina said yesterday, one of the most important legacies of the ICTY is us. The ICTY also transferred knowledge to the region in the support of Defence Council. As Judge Schomburg recalled, there can be no justice without qualified Defence Council. And much in the region has been done. 
We strengthen capacity from the efforts of the criminal defense section here in Bosnia-Herzegovina to trainings by international partners. This legacy has benefited from the many counsel from the region who defended accused at the ICTY and then returned home with a bag of lessons learned. Crucially, the documentation of all we have done over these last 24 years, so much of our legacy encompassed in reams of paper, rows of boxes, will continue to be preserved. The ICTY will leave behind the biggest repository of information related to the wars in the former Yugoslavia. We have six kilometers of physical records, two petabytes of digital data, our judicial case records include 442,000 documents and more than 3 million pages of transcripts and 30,000 hours of unique audio-visual recordings. And it's quite a mouthful, but fortunately, Bob Reed made it a lot simpler for all of us. And he said, when I joined the, the, the OTP as the chief of operations, the first person I should have employed is an archivist. Our archives are not only large, but they are increasingly accessible to current and future generations. In the historical panel, Eva Vukcic told us of her gratitude towards the ICTY for putting our evidence on the internet when no one else has done so. And as a, a scholar and someone from the former Yugoslavia, she thanked us for putting all this information online and which has become one of the most important things in her view that the ICTY has done. But putting documents online is only one first step. In the region, ICTY information centers are being established. Journalists, artists, NGOs are digesting these records, making them more impactful through multimedia projects, particularly aimed at youth. And we heard about this morning, we heard this morning about the importance of our own ICTY outreach program, which was started 18, 18 years ago um, by the prescience of the then president, Gabriel Kirk MacDonald. We also heard this morning the very powerful address by Sandra Bokjuvecci. So Sarandra reminded us all of why we are here how important it is for us to keep working together. Now, while not all of you have been reached and touched by our outreach program, probably all of you have been reached by the work of one person who was the ICTY webmaster for many years. The news of his sudden loss reached us on the first day of the conference, Thomas Rivière, Thomas Duvanumonke. But your legacy will live on most of his colleagues from the Outreach and Communication Unit are here, and they pushed through their pain uh, to keep working here during the conference. And there are no words for your professionalism. I thank you all very much. We started this final ICTY Legacy Conference with a, a video message from Benjamin Ferenz, the now 98-year-old former prosecutor from Nuremberg. And I'd like to conclude by recalling three pieces of advice he gave, he gave to us on Thursday morning. One, never give up. Two, never give up. Three, never give up. For the last 24 years, since President Cassese's alternating periods of nerve-wracking longing to succeed and excruciating fear of total failure, until today, 24 years later, the ICTY has lived this mantra. Through difficult challenges and groundbreaking successes, the ICTY never gave up. And now, as we close, and as someone said this morning, this is your legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. That was an impressive task that you had. Indeed, we have covered so many topics, and the few days we have spent here cannot do justice to all of them.
we would need so much more time to have an in-depth uh, discussion of the tribunal's legacy aspects. But still our panel sessions and also the side events have provided extremely valuable food for thought and reflection as well as concrete suggestions and also, I hope, tools that everyone can take and use in the future. Thank you for this excellent, comprehensive and clear overview. <coughs> Allow me now to share with you some final thoughts. Sixteen years ago, I became a judge of the ICTY. A few short months later, I led the first on-site visit of judges to the region. And it was here in Bosnia and Herzegovina that we came first. Since then, I have come back to Bosnia and Herzegovina and to other parts of the former Yugoslavia on countless occasions. However, this particular visit this time has been of special significance because we have met when the ICTY is winding down with all but two cases completed and another chapter in the history of this region thereby coming to an end. As the last president of the ICTY, I have mixed feelings about this moment. On the one hand, I am immensely proud of our achievements over the past quarter of a century. We have heard over the last few days about many things that could have been done differently or better, but we have also heard about the ICTY's accomplishments and successes. What it did right. And I hope you will all agree with me that there is a lot to be proud of. On the other hand, I also think about all that remains to be done here, as well as in the other republics of ex-Yugoslavia. All of the persons that need to be indicted, all of the cases that need to be concluded, all of the justice still waiting to be done, and reconciliation that is not yet to happen. The tribunal's legacy is an indispensable part of this region's memory, and I sincerely hope will continue to play through its legacy a very important role in the region's future after we are gone. One of the most frequent questions asked of me is whether I think the tribunal has fulfilled its mandate. To this, my response is a categorical yes. The ICTY has met its responsibility to bring to justice those most responsible for the atrocities committed during the wars of the 90s. Is the region better off because of the tribunal or not? As we heard these last two days, people have different views on this, but I strongly believe <coughs> that this region is better off. However, either way, and even if you consider that this region is worse off, after the ICTY closes, it becomes incumbent on you to carry on the work that we have undertaken since 1993. When I say you, I'm referring to the all the stakeholders of the region. I mean prosecutors, judges, defense counsel, NGOs, other members of the civil society, politicians, diplomats, historians, students, indeed all citizens. It will be up to you in the region to move forward but also not to forget the past. It will be up to you to reconcile with each other. More fundamentally, to want to reconcile 
with each other and to deliver justice to all those who still cry for it. The ball will be in your court and it will not be easy. However, I believe it is possible and I consider that the ICTY has throughout its existence provided you with many of the tools that you will need. I sincerely hope that the discussions we have had during this important conference will allow you to learn from our experience and to build on our achievements. I am not going to repeat the words of Benjamin Ferenc, uh, which were so <laughs> well um, uh, <coughs> repeated by, by, by uh, John, but <clears throat> I am remembering an important a quotation from one of, uh, f f coming from uh, Pablo Neruda. You can cut down all the flowers, but you cannot stop spring from arriving. So I thank you, and I now give the floor to the United Nations Legal Council, Mr. Miguel de Serpas Ruiz, to provide his concluding remarks for this conference. Judge um, Edges, President of the ICTY, and my dear friend, uh, John Hawking, the Register, with whom we have uh, worked a lot for the sake of uh, international criminal justice in the last years. Also, Ambassador Sino, thank you for your very strong message on truth and reconciliation. And uh, allow me a special greeting to my United Nations colleague, the resident coordinator in Bosnia, Sezin Sinagulu. So, um, I... I'm deeply honored to be here in Sarajevo for the closing of the ICTY legacy dialogues that the International Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia has organized in the framework of the upcoming closure of the tribunal. I note that according to the conference program, you have been discussing these days the normative, gender justice, non-judicial and operational legacy of the ICTY. Allow me now a few personal remarks on what I would call the moral legacy of the ICTY. Years ago, in October 1999, the then Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, said here in Sarajevo that the United Nations experience in Bosnia was one of the most difficult and painful in its history. He then said, and I quote, no one regrets more than we the opportunities for achieving peace and justice that were missed. No one laments more than we the failure of the international community to take decisive action to halt the suffering and end the war that had produced so many victims." End of quote. He then added that, and I will quote, we will never forget that Bosnia was as much a moral cause as a military conflict and that the tragedy of Srebrenica will haunt our history forever." End of quote. We all remember that in the same year, the Secretary General issued his report on the fall of Srebrenica, stressing that the international community as a whole had to accept its share of responsibility for the ethnic cleansing campaign that culminated in the murder of some 7,000 unarmed civilians in Srebrenica. Morality and responsibility, these are two concepts that are actually intimately linked to the establishment and operation of the ECTY 24 years ago. Indeed, before acknowledging the responsibility of the international community through the 1999 report of the Secretary General, the Security Council established the International Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia, which could be seen as the first measure addressing both the moral duty and the prosecution of those responsible of serious violations of international law. With such a measure, the global community reaffirmed its commitment to addressing the impunity that had caused so much pain and sorrow. 
As I will discuss later, the moral responsibility of the international community to ensure accountability for the victims of crimes of this nature led to the development of various international mechanisms, all which can be seen as emerging from the foundational work of the ICTY. You have discussed during these days ICTY landmark decisions and the development of legal concepts of international criminal law. One of the most important developments to emerge from the ICTY is the principle of the individual criminal responsibility, even with respect to acts of senior government officials. And this is now a generally accepted principle and represents an important and core progress in international criminal law that must be protected. Allow me today to also refer to two more specific examples which show how the fight against impunity has evolved thanks to the work of the international criminal justice system established since the creation of the ICTY in 1993. First, the siege of Sarajevo and the crimes that were committed in that context have an important place in the jurisprudence of the ICTY. In particular, Two Serb officials were convicted for numerous counts of crimes against humanity committed during the siege of Sarajevo. General Stanislav Galic and Dragomir Milosevic were respectively sentenced to life imprisonment and 29 years imprisonment in 2003 and 2007. They were found guilty, among other crimes, for the shelling and sniper terror campaign against Sarajevo, including the first and second Markali massacres. I should add that Radovan Karadzic was sentenced to 40 years in prison for, among other crimes, the siege of Sarajevo. In this case, Mr. Karadzic, as we know, was accused of participating in the Sarajevo joint criminal enterprise and was convicted for murder, unlawful attacks on civilians and terror as violations of the laws or customs of war and for murder as a crime against humanity. The doctrine of the joint criminal enterprise will remain as a major legal development of the ICTY to prosecute those most responsible and in particular political and military leaders. Second, as we know, Sarajevo has been one of the worst destroyed cities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Its cultural uh, and historical heritage as a symbol and base of national and religious cultures shared the destiny of the town and its citizens. The destruction of historic monuments and buildings was indeed a strategic war objective. Both Susan Sontag and the recently disappeared Spanish writer Juan Goitisolo were virtually alone among the well-known writers, artists, and performers of Europe and beyond in coming to Sarajevo during the siege refer to the destruction of the cultural heritage, in particular the library of Sarajevo. The ICTY considered several cases with respect to the destruction of cultural property and has led the way to establishing the criminalization of attacks against cultural property. In this regard, I note that on the 27th uh, September 2016, the International Criminal Court also found Mr. Hamad al-Faki al-Mahdi uh, guilty of the war crime of intentional, intentionally directing attacks against historic monuments and buildings dedicated to religion in Timbuktu, Mali. And this was the first case before the court to be exclusively focused on attacks on cultural property. While the applicable rules of the International Criminal Court and the ICTY defer, the work of the ICTY has opened the door and paved the way for consideration of this crime as the sole basis for establishing a war crime. I should add that while the ICTY decisions have been instrumental in developing international criminal law, most of the ICTY decisions have also been a major step for the establishment of the truth about the war and the terrible atrocities that were committed atrocities which affected generations of citizens and which marked history. As I mentioned earlier, the ICTY has been the foundation for the existing international criminal justice regime. 
I believe it is fair to say that ICTY can be considered the genesis of the global culture of accountability. While tribunals such as the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and the Special Court for Sierra Leone follow the model of the ICTY, other ad hoc institutions with some level of international participation or assistance have also been created and others may be created in the future. This could be along the lines of the new Kosovo Specialist Chambers and the Specialist Prosecutor's Office established by a Kosovo domestic law to prosecute crimes which have been the subject of criminal investigation by the Special Investigative Task Force. Another court to come, building on the legacy of other tribunals, is the proposed hybrid court for South Sudan. The parties to the agreement on the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan, which was signed on the 17th August 2015, agreed that the Ivory Court for South Sudan should be established to assist in ensuring accountability. In addition, non-judicial international accountability mechanisms are now being seriously considered and even established. In contexts where it is difficult to foresee effective accountability, there is an increasing appetite for, at a minimum, gathering and securing evidence in the meantime so that such evidence can be used in national, regional, or international courts that may in the future have jurisdiction over these crimes. And in this regard, the General Assembly established in December 2016 the new investigative mechanism for Syria to preserve and analyze evidence of violations of international humanitarian law and human rights violations. There have been calls for similar mechanisms elsewhere, including in South Sudan and Iraq. As these new are new mechanisms, we do not have evidence yet to say how they will fare in the future and if they will lead to actual prosecutions of crimes. A caution that is necessary to examine carefully the initiatives to establish new mechanisms. For example, some states could seek to delay the prosecution of international crimes by accepting the establishment of investigative mechanisms. Others may prefer to create new and expensive structures instead of accepting the International Criminal Court jurisdiction. The outreach and the development of capacity building at the domestic level may also consequently be delayed. Now, as seen with the ICTY, it is important to remember that any ad hoc tribunals and any investigative mechanisms engaging with victims may give rise to entities that are necessary in order to discharge the residual functions arising from international criminal justice. These functions include not only witness protection, but supervision of enforcement of sentences, petitions for early release, contempt cases, review of judgments and sentences, and management of archives. States need to be aware that when they create any of these structures, it is a long-term process, and these structures will likely need to exist for a period of time that goes well beyond the collection of evidence or the delivery of judgments. And the failure to account for these long times can lead to fatigue regarding financial support. As we are in a legacy event, let's now look into the future and reflect on four specific areas that could be improved in the future and which could concern all international and, trib uh, and tribunals with any sort of international participation or assistance. One is of a financial nature, while the three others relate to efficiency and governance. The ICTY benefited from funding through assessed contributions of United Nations member states. However, the length of the trials and the cost has raised questions about the financing of these types of mechanism and the possibility of improving efficiency. Several other institutions that have followed the ICTY have been financed through voluntary contributions. Finding resources to sustainably support these institutions remains a problem. Already today, as members of the international community consider creating new institutions as the ones described above, funding for some of the existing hybrid institutions that are voluntary funded has largely dried up 
putting at risk the orderly conduct of the judicial process. Based on lessons learned, and in particular on the international residual mechanism for criminal tribunals experience, consideration may be given in other tribunals to the possibility of appointing judges would be paid on a when employed basis for functions they may not run continuously. When we talk about efficiency, the issue of the length of the proceedings has been identified as a concern in particular for those who fund the tribunals. It appears that one reason that funding erodes over time is that the cases take so long. Of course, the cases are very complex and the proper administration of justice requires that issues be adequately investigated, proved and judged. But there is no requirement that the decision in a criminal case stand as the definitive historical treatment of a particular incident, nor is it necessary that an accused be tried of all crimes that he or she may possibly have committed. There is an element of discretion that perhaps can be applied here. There is also an opportunity for hard dog international criminal tribunals and hybrid tribunals to further development mechanisms of governance of their activities. There should be a way of monitoring judicial productivity to ensure expeditious resolution of cases without endangering judicial independence as happens in any national system. Comparable oversight should also exist for investigations and prosecutorial functions. In addition, there are increasing calls for judicial accountability and for the need for mechanisms for responding to complaints to ensure procedural fairness and certainly for all involved when allegations of judicial misconduct arise. Last but not least, the treatment of victims. The very nature of the most serious violations of international law leaves a victim vulnerable and often in need of assistance. Victims are often, for the very first time, involved in a criminal justice system and may have to speak to police officers, investigators, lawyers and judges, and ultimately go to court. Victims can find these processes confusing and overwhelming, particularly when they have an international component. A reflection needs to be undertaken to seek to ensure that victims are recognized and treated with respect and dignity, that they are protected from further victimization and intimidation from the offenders and further distress when they take part in the criminal justice process, that they receive appropriate support throughout proceedings and have access to justice. Important progress has been made by different international and hybrid tribunals. Many of them have witnesses and victim support sections responsible for providing various forms of crucial support to victims at their various stages of cooperation with these tribunals, including but not limited to expert psychological support and measures to ensure their protection. Some tribunals have established field offices like the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda Mechanism in Kigali, Rwanda, which provides essential support to victims and witnesses. The International Criminal Court also provides support to victims through its Trust Fund for Victims, which is a, a mandated to secure reparations and appropriate forms of assistance for victims of serious crimes. This brings me to the conclusion. In an ideal scenario, institutions such as the ICTY would not be necessary and domestic jurisdictions should assume the main responsibility in the prosecution of international crimes while offering guarantees to respect international standards. The important work of building domestic capacity in this regard continues to be necessary. However, we have seen in the wake of the ICTY and the other international tribunals, states appear to be more able and willing to utilize the massing prosecutions for international crimes with some assistance of the international community and with different levels of international participation. One example is the Special Criminal Court in the Central African Republic, which includes international judges, an international prosecutor, and an international deputy register. Another example is the Colombia Special Jurisdiction for Peace, which will be composed exclusively by, of Colombian judges, but allows the participation of foreign amicus curia lawyers. 
Sri Lanka could be in the future a scenario for another domestic judicial me mechanism with some sort of international participation. I said the ideal scenario, as in some contexts, this is simply not an option. In this regard, allow me to finish by referring to Slavenka Draculic, a Croatian novelist, and the 2004 essay, They Would Never Hurt a Fly, which is a psychological analysis of war criminals being tried in The Hague. At some point, she describes the strong emotions that the only mention of the name of the city, The Hague, provokes in the Balkans and the little desire in these societies to uncover the truth. Ms. Dracolish concludes that in the case of the crimes committed in the Balkans, and I quote, justice simply has to come from The Hague or it will not come at all, and all because we ourselves are not capable of washing our own dirty, bloody laundry, end of quote. And she adds, I quote, we do not even realize yet the need to do it, end of quote. In these situations, as was the case with the ICTY, the international community will need to continue to be the driving force to ensure accountability and provide justice to victims. I commend very strongly the legacy efforts undertaken by the ICTY as they will remind the international community that our work to ensure respect for human rights and the rule of law continues that the cause of justice endures, and that the hope to end impunity lives on. The ICTY lives behind a powerful legacy of which we can justly be proud. Thank you. I wish to thank the United Nations Legal Council for his insightful uh, uh, remarks, in particular the way he placed the work of the ICTY in the historical and political context of the region and emphasized the importance of establishing judicial accountability as an indispensable element for making peace sustainable. This is uh, precisely what uh, we must take away with us from this legacy uh, conference, our final legacy conference. Now, before this conference comes to a final close, I have a few thank yous to give. On behalf of the principals of the ICTY, I would like to thank everybody who attended this conference, and especially those who stayed until the end. I know that these have been long days with intense discussions. However, they have been very fruitful, and we are concluding on a very constructive note with specific <coughs> conclusions and recommendations and a message of hope. Allow me also to express once more my sincere gratitude and that of the entire tribunal to all those who sponsored this uh, conference, as well as those who have organized it. My deep thanks go particularly to the planning committee. I know how much they have worked, and the staff of the tribunal, who have worked so hard in bringing this event together, as well as everyone outside the tribunal who cooperated with us over many months to make this conference happen. I would like to thank everybody who took an active part in the panel discussions, along with the moderators and the panelists who shared such valuable insights. You have made this a truly fantastic event. Thank you. Of course, a huge thanks must uh, also go to our interpreters who have enabled us to communicate and understand each other throughout the panel sessions and side events. You have, as always, done a remarkable job. Finally, I also would like to thank the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and again, once more, 
his legal counsel, Miguel de Serpa Suarez, for their support. It is an indication of how highly international justice and accountability ranks in the United Nations agenda when we are honored with the presence of the organization's highest ranking official for legal affairs at our legacy conference. It is important for the whole region to know that the United Nations is with you and will continue to be with you even when the ICTY closes down. To all of you here and to all of you who are tuned in from our webcast, Havala, thank you. We will see each other again. The ICTY Legacy Dialogues Conference held from the 22nd to the 24th of June 2017 in this beautiful city of Sarajevo has now concluded. Dear participants, please remain seated. Our assistants will now hand you the conclusions and recommendations that the board has been so hard working over, over the night. So please remain seated for just another minute. Thank you. Molim sve da ostanu na svojim mestima. Sada ćemo podeliti zaključke i preporuke sa konferencije na kojima je osoblje tribunala naporno radilo preko noći. Tako da vas molim za samo još minut strpljenja. Hvala vam najlepše.